funding for Discovery Road brought to you in part by the National Park Service. Hello again, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Discovery Road. In this episode, a trip back in time, a fascinating peek into one man's family scrapbook. Really, it's a story of American heritage that belongs in a museum, plus the importance of architecture and landscape and the challenge of yesterday's pioneer life. Make yourself comfortable, everyone. Pull up a chair. Discovery Road is on the air. The urge for people to travel, to find a better place, to find themselves, and to be free, is at the core of America itself. First from Europe, braving the cold water waves, sailing into the dark and deep unknown, then across the plains. The spirit of America was born from these struggles and forged by the journey itself. It took between you know, five and six weeks on the sailing ships to get across the Atlantic and uh, they would generally leave in the, the winter, late winter, so that they could get to America and get them on the wagons and get to Salt Lake City before, you know, the late fall. So they would be leaving in the winter and there would be, you know, Atlantic storms and it wasn't unusual for people to be thrown overboard and, to, you know, people to, to die on the ship. The Mormons crossing the plains is a riveting and timeless story. Trail centers, tourist stops, and roadside markers document the trek and are popular sites for visitors from around the world. And then comes the chapter of where the Mormons settled and how it happened. The fact that they, they put the community first, that you know that these were church-led colonizations area uh, uh, in general into places like the Little Colorado River region uh, in uh, Arizona, into Idaho, uh, the Muddy Mission, the Las Vegas Mission, these areas almost certainly wouldn't have been settled as early as they were. And the infrastructures they created, you know, with the irrigation systems and, you know, the farms and the fields uh, uh, really you know, establish this as what's generally known as the culture, uh, the Mormon cultural area. And then of course it's grown into one of the great places of the West and the modern era. The students at Southern Utah University will never take a test tougher than the one this monument on their campus represents. But it's a story they should know about. Excited new students at Southern Utah University gathered around a piece of history as they start writing the next chapter in an amazing story about education. But none of the beautiful, spacious campus would even exist if it weren't for a group of tough, determined people and one big, strong horse who together passed a very difficult test of endurance more than a century ago. Christmas time 1897 in Cedar City, Utah was restrained. Higher education was in jeopardy. State officials demanded that the city have a dedicated building in order to be in compliance or there would be no school here. They argued it out and voted as a community they would do whatever had to be done. If it had to be done by next September, they'll build it in the wintertime. Money was raised, supplies were gathered, Workers started chiseling 250,000 bricks, and one man even donated some prized lumber he had been saving for his own coffin. This map shows how others headed into the mountains for timber, but snowstorms and drifts nearly killed them, until an old sorrel horse 
showed everyone how to plod through the snow. And he would come and hit the snow banks, heaved a huge sigh, then got up, hit the snow banks again, then went back down and did this thing until finally he would get them through. But truly, it's a remarkable story of sacrifice and great faith in the power of education. Today, education thrives on the campus of Southern Utah University, and the Founders Monument ensures that the story of endurance is not lost. Storytelling is vital to history, and when a story is married to a powerful image, the impact is everlasting. Like this Civil War photo, Plate 36, better known as Harvest of Death. The photographer, Timothy O'Sullivan, got in a squabble over proper credit for his images, so he loaded his mule-driven photo wagon and headed west. As an official photographer for the government, he was tasked with showing the uncharted American West in order to attract settlers. When you think about the frontier for photographers, I think they have got to have been of hardy stock because if you think about it, here they are, they've either got horses or mules and they pack all their equipment, their gear, their chemicals, their glass because they have, they don't have paper at this time that they make the photographs on. The cameras, their tripods, the tents, how they have had to develop everything. And rugged, rugged, they were rugged, rugged men. O'Sullivan's landscape pictures were potent documents of the raw, untamed West and his images of the people on the land, like these Paiute Native Americans in 1872, near what is now Cedar City, Utah, is a remarkable glimpse into a time capsule. Okay, this is an early domestic science class. Notice the jar of canned fruit. This is an early Looks like this is track and field. Looks like we won the championship, second place winners. Notice their shorty shorts. <laughs> and this is the class of 1907, BNS Branch Normal School. So historical photographs are important because they are the most accurate primary resource that you can have. A document's great, but sometimes if someone's written something, it can be a little bit biased. But if you see a photograph, it's got, it freezes just that moment in time. And when you look at it, then it documents that moment right in time. And so that's important. Once the Mormons started arriving, the taming had begun. They had a plan, a very good plan, of how things should look and work out here. It became known as the Platte of Zion, a roadmap of sorts, a sort of street guide offering exact measurements, precise distances for lots, blocks, allowing room for gardens, fruit trees, even an idea of how many people should live in a town. If you are a architect and you've been hired to restore a building, you can look at a historic photograph of that building and see the gingerbread around the windows and see what the porch was like, the woodwork on the porch, what the door was like, and you can restore that home back to its original feel. A visit to historic Spring City, Utah will give you a very good idea of what the early Mormon pioneers had in mind. It's all here. The tree-lined wide streets productive fruit trees and gardens, and their signature architecture style in the homes, buildings, and in the schools. Are you seeing a different type of tourists or groups mm -hmm. coming to your community? And people are coming for that reason. We have our heritage days. They go through the various homes here. They get excited about historical preservation. They get excited about the pioneer. And the, the, the whole artist connection with history 
that has a part to play too, doesn't it? Definitely, not? definitely. That, that, that's a very large segment of our population and that brings people in. Preserving the past is why these workers, local and state officials, and National Park Service people are gathering and touring the heritage area. I'm Alex Hernandez, National Park Service. They wasn't going to allow the, the city to steal the bell or to melt the bell down for money. So they actually took it and had it hid for quite a few number of years. It was hidden in somebody's granary. It was hidden in their granary, yep, down on Main Street. And this did not come to light until, until they found out they we were working save the on building. this bell tower. Yep. Local communities can really have a lasting impact on their area in bringing these stories to light. And when it comes to Mormon pioneer settlement here, you can already see that it has a huge um, significance to the local people, but sharing that with the broader nation is something that uh, we're really, really proud to be a part of. And uh, I think it's a great partnership top type of model to have within the National Park Service in the nation. Then they also built them taller so the lights would come through all through the day, so they even studied this to figure out how much light would go into the buildings. And then they would put in extra windows in the hallways so that there was lots of light for, for safety. So as much as we think of this as a pioneer building, it really was a very progressive building yes. for its time. So I think it would be great to get more. I think I got there. I want to switch after going in there. It was a lot cozier, but it was cool, and you could see how it could really, you know, protect you from the elements. I wonder if they had fire in there, cook stoves or heating. I think it was smoke up. Yeah, they'd have to come up with some type of chimney feature. Maybe that's, what that Maybe that's is. Quite cool. This site here with the Native American component shows a whole other dimension. And what I really like is it shows this continuity of humans on this land. And every community we stopped in yesterday, that's where Native Americans would have lived too. too far down the road, we wanted to tell you about one of the most important stories we've ever discovered along Heritage Highway 89. It's the story of a young boy who found the simple joy of a family road trip, not only a precious memory, but in a very real sense, the beginning of what would become a national heritage area. Once the Great American Road Trip idea got rolling, there was no stopping it. Moms, dads, and lots of kids piled in for the ride, including a youngster named Bob Bennett. I remember when uh, Utah was two highways, 89 and 91. And uh, when I was involved in my father's political campaigns, when you say you're gonna visit Southern Utah, you go down 89 and you come back 91, or vice versa, it didn't much matter. When the interstate came along and took basically the route of Highway 91, it had the effect of leaving 89 behind in terms of uh, a lot of tourist activity. That meant it left a lot of history behind because this is a part of the state where the Mormon pioneers did a lot of pioneering, a lot of settling, and it's important that that history not be lost. No one knows precisely how the road helped shape the great career of Senator Bob Bennett. But without question, he had an impact on the historic highway that zigzags through the heart of Utah. His family's story, a heritage of hard work, deep roots, faith and values, 
a family with America stamped on it. And this was the home his parents, Wallace and Francis Bennett, had built. A very unique home. It's both traditional and modern. Well, the architect said, all right, the front of the house is Mrs. Bennett's and the back of the house is Mr. Bennett's. So we have the front, a very traditional house, and the back, a uh, glass all around the back. It was the first home in Salt Lake City to be fully air-conditioned. And to keep children from cluttering the living room, it has nine outside doors. They didn't live here very long because Bob's father was elected to the Senate and they sold the house and it went through several owners and it came back on the market and Bob bought it. And uh, we have added on to it, added a family room and finished the basement. But it is a fun piece of heritage of our family. And what it is, this is the constitution of the state of Deseret. The first page and the signature page. And the date is March 27th, 1856. Taken from the National Archives. Uh -huh. And included in the signatures are Jedediah M. Grant and Daniel H. Wells, who are... Well, they're the first two. The first, first two there, that are Dad's great-grandfathers. Historic documents, photos, citations, awards, and memorabilia from the family, and the storied political career of Senator Bob Bennett. History was always very important to Dad, uh, family history, national history, any kind of history. And there were many times when it was just the two of us in the car, and he would say, do you got a few minutes? Let's go look at this. And he would go show me spots in Salt Lake that were important to him, where some different family members had lived or they had different things they had done, just because he wanted to make sure to share that heritage. And we would just, and would just tell stories the whole time, and that was time that I always treasured. My father was very conscious of the sense of heritage that he had even from an early age. Uh, he remembers, he used to talk about the fact that his grandfather, Heber J. Grant, who was president of the LDS Church, was in his declining years while my father was growing up and at one point it was his responsibility to walk with him and stabilize him to make sure he didn't fall over. And dad said that he felt like if he let him fall over, he'd be letting the church down and he'd be had this tremendous responsibility uh, to make sure that his grandfather stayed upright, not just literally, but figuratively as well. The influence Grant had on a young Bennett goes even deeper. At an early age, Heber J. Grant was taught to care for his mother. And as an adult, he ended up raising 10 daughters of his own. He basically raised um, a household of women and because he learned how to cherish women so beautifully, um, I believe that was passed on to his posterity because each of those daughters felt loved, including my grandmother. And then that would mean that my father was raised in a home that was cherished by, by that learned how to cherish women. And he, he valued women because he had four daughters of his own, including myself. And I always felt loved and honored my whole life. Visiting the Bennett family home is a bit like opening up a music box. And there was music in the air all the time. Besides being interested in history, Bob was always interested in music. It was, we breathed and we had a library and four to ceiling books. And that is certainly heritage. It was that kind of a house. There's one more thing you should know about Senator Bob Bennett, his appreciation of art. And I want to thank Senator Bennett for being with us. Thank you. I bought this, frankly, solely because it was a lab. It came on the market, and I thought, oh, geez, that's not the lab I know. You know, this is the lab I know. But okay, if it's a lab, I'll buy it. 
It hangs in my office here in Washington that I've opened since I left the Senate across the room from me and subtly and quietly calms me every day. The painting owns you. Here he's lecturing at the Smithsonian, his art history acumen on display on a very big stage. But he was just as comfortable and caring on a small stage, like this living room in Huntsville, Utah, as a tour guide giving history on the boyhood home of his wife's grandfather, David O. McKay. Parlor or front room, but this was the room where most of the family stuff went on. This is the uh, uh, house that David McKay grew up in, in Thurso, Scotland. And you see, it's the same thing here. You've got the chimney on either side, a central entrance, and then windows on either side. It's just the same as you have here. National Heritage Area was not easy, but once Senator Bob Bennett took the wheel, so to speak, the road trip was gift-wrapped for all of us to enjoy. Um, what he contributed will resonate forever in the success of what was created here, just because he, he knew how to bring it on home and get the designation, and he knew what that would mean, and that it would fulfill all the goals and aspirations that the individuals up and down the highway had been expressing in their own way, but hadn't been able to articulate in that big picture way. So I think he was probably the, the one single champion who could have pulled that off. The ringing school bell, a symbol of the past, its sound capturing the soul with each ring, an enchanting note about history, culture, and heritage, a call to the community announcing a lofty occasion. And without him, this, this would not be possible. The incredible projects that have been done along Highway 89, along this National Heritage Area, this, this could not have happened without the, the, the vision, the foresight, and the tenacity of Senator Bennett. And we're so grateful for that legacy that he has left to us. It's out here on the open road where you find culture and landscape in abundance and stories that define all of us, really. It's sort of like a good friend telling you what's ahead and reminding you of what you might have missed. I'm James Nelson. We'll see you next time out here on Discovery Road.